Okay, welcome. Uh, we'll get started here in just a second, continuing on with uh, chapter 13. And go ahead and type your here in the chat box. That would be great. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we've been uh, talking chapter 13 here, and um, again, uh, it looks like most of you did type here in the chat box uh, for roll. Also, again, if you're just coming in, please do that. And then if you do have any questions, obviously throughout the lecture, feel free to ask them in there and we'll get to your questions and hopefully get them answers and stuff like that. So last time we sort of delved into uh, equilibrium and solving for equilibrium concentrations. So again, a little bit different than just having the equilibrium concentrations where we just plug it into the expression or something like that uh, to find the equilibrium constant. Here we're typically given the initial concentrations of the reactants, could be reactants and products. And we do need to solve these guys using really a format known as the ice table. And as we talked about last time, the ice table uh, stands for initial change and equilibrium. And we go into the ice table with molarity. So we take the molarity of everybody initially there and we represent the change part of the ice table with like a letter like X, for example. And again, if we have a reaction uh, such as what we got going on in general like this. So we initially have perhaps our molarity of these guys if we're not given anything on the product side, we again could assume that it's zero and that this reaction again is probably headed in that direction. The change part is minus X, minus X and plus two X in this example here. Again, as we talked about, since we're assuming that this reaction is heading towards the product side, uh, that means that the reactants should be lowering in their concentrations. So that's why we represent it by the minuses of X on the change part. While if the reaction is heading towards the product side, uh, we represent that with a plus on the uh, product side there for the X. And the other important thing that we talked about is really for stoichiometry purposes, our multiple relationship to make sure everything is sort of calculated correctly. Uh, you do need to take the coefficients that you find uh, in the balance equation here and insert them with your X part. So. The guys in my little example here on top are ones in terms of their coefficients, uh, so we don't have to put anything there. And then we pretty much just kind of bring that down. We take our initial molarity minus X, our initial molarity minus X, and then we have two X. And again, we put those X's into our equilibrium expression. And usually you are given the value of K, so we'll just call it 50. And at this point, like we talked about, we've seen a couple of different ways to sort of uh, solve these problems. Uh, we had sort of a perfect square in one situation. You could use the quadratic formula to solve it, but essentially what we're going to do is put uh, those values in and solve for X. When we do solve for X, that is going to represent the change part. And that's important because that X value will be all of the X values all the way across our table. And what that will allow us to do is once we know the value of X, we then can obviously solve for the actual equilibrium concentrations of everybody. And then we would know what they would be um, at, at um, equilibrium. Now, um, when we do that, as we also talked about, since it really is just a math problem for the most part, uh, the good thing is you could kind of check yourself. So uh, you could kind of check the math at the end. So when you get all your values at equilibrium, you should be able to put it back into the equilibrium expression and that should equal obviously the value of the equilibrium constant that was given to you in the particular problem. We also talked about Q uh, last time, Q which is the reaction quotient, calculated the exact same way as you calculate uh, K. The only difference is for the most part what we use Q for is to determine whether or not the reaction is at equilibrium. 
And if the reaction is not at equilibrium, then it will also tell us which way the reaction needs to proceed to reach equilibrium. Do they need to proceed towards the product side? Does it need to proceed towards the reactant side? But it will give you all that sort of information. We also saw that if you calculate Q and it equals K, uh, that means that the system is at equilibrium at that point. Uh, again, if you calculate Q and it's less than K, that means not at equilibrium, needs to make more products. And if you calculate Q and it's greater than K, then it's not at equilibrium and you need to make more reactants. So we did Q and there's really, like I was talking about last time, sort of two types of Q problems where you would use it. One is like we saw, which is just a, just a basic Q type problem where they essentially ask you, are you at equilibrium? And if you're not at equilibrium, which way you need to go? Remember, you just pretty much, if you're going to calculate Q for this particular reaction here, it would be the exact same thing as what we have above. Obviously, with the initial concentrations, not the X's or anything like that, but just the initial concentrations would go in there. Um, so it's a question like that. The second place is actually in this problem where we left off, where you were hopefully supposed to finish. But if you didn't, I guess we'll continue through it here. Uh, in this particular problem, we were looking for the equilibrium concentrations of everybody. Uh, so we do have to do an ice table. But in this particular example here, we are given the starting amounts of everybody. So we're given the starting amounts of all of our reactants. We're given the starting amounts of all of our products. And that does allow us to calculate Q. And I think that's sort of where we left off last time. And when we do calculate Q in this particular, whoops, come back. In this particular problem here, uh, we just put in our initial concentrations. So again, as I mentioned before, you could kind of see here, Q is calculated exactly how you would calculate K, products over reactants, still use the coefficients as those exponents. And when we put it in this particular example here, we get 19.5. And 19.5 in this case, because K was, I believe, 54.3, if I'm not mistaken. So K was like 54.3 we see that Q is less than the K value. So again, the first thing that tells us is it's not at equilibrium, which we could probably imagine. Otherwise, again, not much of a problem here to solve. But more importantly, what it tells us is this reaction should proceed towards the product side to reach equilibrium. And again, in our ice table, what that sort of reassures us as is that the reactants should be the ones with the minuses and the products should be the ones with the positive X's when we're going in that direction. Again, like I said, if you perhaps just blow by this sort of step here in this problem, uh, you'd probably be okay in most cases, but not 100% of the time, but 90-ish percent, 95%, even maybe higher, uh, you'd probably be okay. But in reality, because you do have enough information, you really should sort of check uh, the value of Q and just to verify that the reaction is proceeding uh, towards the product side. Any questions on any of that stuff there that we talked about? Okay, so uh, we were hopefully supposed to kind of continue to work on this one. So at this point, we actually can get to the problem and we can do our ice table problem and we'll go here, I think. And in this case, we would want to start with, I would like to see what the problem was. Hang on here. So we have, all right, so we have our H2 plus our I2 going to our 2HI. And we have some initial concentrations here. And we have that the H2 is 0 0.00623. And from the problem, the I2 is 0 0.00414. And again, here we do have a starting amount of our product side there. And that is 0 0.0224. And our K value in this case was 54.3. So if we continue uh, going through our ice table here, the change part is gonna be minus X, minus X, 
and again here plus 2x because of the 2 that is there. We will carry those guys down. 0 0.00623 minus x, 0 0.00414 minus x, 0 0.0224 plus 2x. Remember that what we want to do at this point is put it into our equilibrium expression. So our equilibrium expression for this guy is going to be our products, which is our HI. We also, again, need to square it because of the coefficient divided by H2 divided by I2. And that is going to equal our K value of 54.3. So at this point, we're going to put everybody in there and we will get something that looks like this 0 0.0224 plus 2x we're going to square it divided by 0 0.00623 minus x and 0 0.00414 uh, minus x and that's going to equal 54.3 that looks like some fun necessary, right? So to solve this right, we're going to have to do some, what they call that, factoring, all that kind of stuff, foiling, whatever you want to do with that. So you got to factor out the top, factor out the bottom, and then multiply everything to the other side. Hopefully you worked on this. If not, let's take a look. I think I worked it out because I didn't want to do it on the fly. So if we go through here, here's hopefully what you get. If we take our top, so just to walk you through it here, if we take the top one there, and again, we multiply it by itself, we do get something like what we get there on top. If we factor, foil, whatever you want to call that there on the bottom, should get you to this situation. And then the next one here is I just kind of cleaned everything up on top. So I combined the X's on the top and combined the X's on the bottom and it should get you this sort of expression here. At this point, what you wanna do is take everything you got on the bottom, so everything right here needs to get multiplied to the other side, so we're gonna multiply everything on the bottom by 54.3, and hopefully not lose any zeros or anything like that when we come to the other side, and that will get us this equation here. And then what we want to do is combine everybody, right? So we want to get everybody to one side. It really doesn't matter, but usually most people will keep the x squared, the positive number. So uh, we'll bring everything on the left-hand side on this side over here. So we'll bring everything that's over here to the other side. And when we do that, we end up with our final equation there of 50.3x squared minus 0.6543x plus 0 0.00898 equals zero, give or take a little, depending if you rounded differently than I did, but you should get somewhere in that ballpark. That is a long way to go. I am expecting you to uh, I am expecting you to show the work, if you will. So I am expecting you to show the work when we answer both questions there. You, you are expected to show the work. Uh, this one is quite a little complicated, uh, but you do need to show some work. So let me put it this way. Uh, you need to show some work. You can't just lay it up in your calculator per se and, and get the answer, but you got to show some of the steps. Uh, along the way. So um, ideally you should show it all, but you got to at least show something along the way to show me how you got, you know, show me how you just got to this. You got to kind of show me something as to how you got to that equation. Um, you can't just magically appear. So you got to show something along the way on the exam and stuff for like for sure. Um, if you have to go maybe every step like I did there, you, you don't have to. If you could kind of combine things in a few couple of steps or stuff like that, that's all good but you do definitely need to show something along the way.
uh, after we squared. No, because uh, 54, okay, 50, yeah. <laughs> Uh, 54.3 is just a K value. So we didn't do anything to that side at that point yet. Other questions on that? So that's sort of the intermediate steps there worked out. And again, probably a little bit on the more difficult side of this one, a lot more factoring and stuff going on. But it does illustrate a really important point about this. You do want to be really careful as you're going through it. I do it all the time. Sometimes, you know, you lose a zero, forget to write a zero, you know, something like that. Um, you know, and obviously it can affect uh, what you get at the end and stuff like that. So um, sometimes you do have to kind of carry an equation up or something like that or over. So just be very careful as you're kind of moving things around that, you know, you don't lose a number or anything like that. It happens to me all the time. I am kind of go really quick as I'm writing and sometimes I'm like, oh, I guess I lost a zero there or something like that. So definitely keep that in mind. So after you do all that work, you know, you can actually get almost to the problem now. So we have our A, right, for our quadratic. Uh, we got our B, and obviously we have our C as well. So uh, let us uh, go into that quadratic, and I probably should uh, remember what that number is I just wrote there. So <clears throat> let's grab something to scribble on real quick. That probably sounds lovely to you, I'm sure. All right. So. <laughs> We have 50.3 minus 0 0.6543 and 0 0.000898. I think I copied it right. Hopefully, I didn't lose anything. All right. So now what we're going to do is right, go into our quadratic here. So that's going to get us our x, x is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. So if we pop in our numbers there, it looks like we have uh, 0 0.6543 plus or minus. And I'm just going to kind of clean up what's inside the parentheses, uh, the square root. So inside the square root, we have our b, which we're going to square. So 0 0.6543 squared minus uh, four times a, which in this case is 50.3, times our c, which is 0 0.000898. So hopefully if I didn't mess that up inside the square root, we should have uh, 0 0.2474. And if we take a little square root of that, we will end up with hopefully, uh, 0 0.4974. And that's going to be divided by 2 times A, which would be 2 times 50.3, gets us 100.6. If I punch all that in right, let me just double check real quick to make sure. Okay, so this is going to lead us to two answers. So we'll get one answer, which will be 0 0.6543 plus the 0 0.4974 divided by the 100.6. Looks like it gets us perhaps an X value of 0 0.0114. We'll take the 0 0.6543 and minus it from 0.4974 and divided by 100.6, and we'll end up with 0 0.00156, we'll call it. So going back to <clears throat> our equilibrium line there, which was, where's our equilibrium line there? Our equilibrium line basically had for our H2, we had uh, 0 0.00623 minus x. For our i2, we had 0 0.00414 minus x. And for our hi, we had 0 0.0224. 
uh, plus 2x. So when we're comparing our x values, we see that this number here, if we were to put it back in, going to be too large. So this is going to be too big. Again, that's going to give us a negative concentration, which we can't have. So I'm hoping the other one's right. So let's see how we did here, hopefully. 0 0.00623 minus 0 0.00156. And that will get us point zero zero four six seven molar. This guy would be point zero zero four one four minus point zero zero one five six. Gets us point zero zero two five eight. Hang on here. I just gotta move something out of my way here that out of the way there we go and that's gonna get us uh five eight and lastly 0 0.0224 plus two times 0 0.00156 it's gonna get us point zero two five five And this should be our equilibrium concentrations of everybody if we didn't mess up or I didn't mess up along the way, hopefully not. And again, if we put it back into our equilibrium expression, uh, we should get something like 54-ish, uh, 0.3. I think we get about 54. Any questions on that? It is, uh, I'll put it this way, it is something that you should know how to do. So you may have to use a quadratic formula to solve a problem on the exam. Will it be maybe this in detail? Maybe not. It might be more like the first one we did, which was a little bit easier of a quadratic sort of formula or equation. Um, but technically speaking, it is something that you should know how to do and possibly could appear. So. Again, obviously there's different layers of factoring and math that you have to do. You know, you should be able to do a problem like this, just like you should be able to do uh, the previous problem and the first one that we did, which was also a quadratic format, but a little less factoring and stuff like that. So the general answer would be it's sort of fair game. Yeah, I guess you need to know how to kind of do it. Other questions on that? All right, so again, if we put those numbers back in, I think I get about 54, which is good. And that means hopefully we didn't screw up anywhere along the way. Any questions on where any of those things come from? So again, there's a lot of places where, you know, you can make an error in the math part of it. So you do want to be very careful as you kind of go through it, uh, just to make sure again, very common things that people do is like I said, lose a zero, add an extra zero. The other common thing that people do is uh, like on the table, this one we actually had plus something. Uh, sometimes people are so used to doing the minuses, they do the minus on that side instead of the plus. So you do want to be really kind of careful as you go through it. Any questions on that particular one? Okay. Yeah, so you it's all or nothing really you know you you get all the credit or no credit i'm kidding by the way don't all go drop right now or anything like that i'm just kidding uh no you you'll get partial credit so look if you uh if everything else kind of looks right uh but you kind of messed up some of the math you're gonna obviously lose some points because you know you got the wrong answer and stuff like that uh but you won't probably be zeroed out or anything like that so uh, as long as you showed something. So that sort of goes back to an earlier question somebody asked as well. That's, that's why it's kind of important to, you know, kind of show the steps along the way. So just in case, you know, you did kind of screw something up, if the only thing you give me is sort of like just the equation and maybe the wrong answers, I got really nothing to kind of give you credit for. So that's why it's really important to show your work. And like I said, um, 
as long as it's not like gibberish and you just wrote a whole bunch of BS there on the page just to kind of fill the page, um, you know, you, you won't, in most cases, you shouldn't get zeroed out on a problem if you messed up somewhere along the way. Will you lose points? You probably will, but you know, um, you won't get zeroed out or anything like that. Yeah, I tried to do that as well. So, you know, it, and your question is like, if you screwed up, you know, the answer for part A and you needed that for part B, C and whatever it is. Yeah, I, I did take that in account. So again, that's why it's important for all the parts of the question that you showed the work. Uh, so that again, if you sort of started with the wrong answer, but you know, you sort of showed the right work on the next steps, even though, you know, you're never gonna get that right answer because you started with the wrong one to begin with. Uh, you'll still get some, you get some points and stuff, obviously. You won't, again, be zeroed out on all three parts of the question or anything like that, okay? I mean, to be honest with you, for me to zero you out, you pretty much have to write nothing there or just a bunch of junk or just recopy the numbers in the problem or something like that. But again, if you sort of progress in the problem or make some progression towards an answer, uh, even if the answer is wrong, you, you'll get some points and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it's not like an all or nothing thing. So just to be clear, I was joking when I said that. It's not an all or nothing. Uh, you will get some partial points and stuff like that. Again, it all depends on the problem, how many steps, the point values, obviously, as you would know. Other questions on that? Okay. So uh, let's see here. Hopefully they agreed with what we got, I hope. Yeah. So I think they did. That's good. All right, so we got one more here to go. So why don't you give this one a go and make sure. So here again, we're looking for, we actually have a KP value given to us and we're looking for uh, the pressures of everybody at equilibrium. And we're actually starting with pressures. So as we talked about before, you could do these type of problems with molarity. It works the exact same way with pressure. So again, you still wanna do an ice table. You wanna solve it the same way you would if these were concentrations, but they just happen to be pressures. So why don't you take a few minutes or so, start working towards it, and then we'll go through it together. And again, make sure everybody here is on the same page in terms of the answer.
Okay, so let's take a look and see how we're progressing on this particular one here. So I'm just going to recopy it here on the next slide. Uh, so we got N2 plus 3H2 and our 2NH3. Our KP in this case is uh, 4.31 times 10 to the minus 4. So initially we have pressure. So again, it works the same way as concentration. So we're just gonna put our pressures in and 0.373 here and zero. So let's just talk a little bit about pressures here and stuff uh, in terms of ice tables. And I think I might've mentioned it last time, but just to clarify, when you are doing an ice table that involves pressures and you're using a KP value, you do want to make sure that the pressures are in atmosphere. So they do need to be in atmospheres. And as mentioned last time, even if they give you the pressures in some other unit like tor, you know, bar, millimeters of mercury, whatever it may be, you do need to convert those units, guys, into the units of atmospheres and then put it into the ice table, do the ice table calculation. And then if they want some other unit at the end, you then can convert it from atmospheres back into some other unit. So again, sometimes people run into a problem with that because like I mentioned last time, they give you everybody say in TOR and they ask you to give the answer in TOR. So people think, yeah, you could just go into the ice table in TOR, but you usually have to convert it to atmospheres just to be on the safe side and then you know convert to some other unit. Now everything's gonna work the same here. So we're going to do our change part, which is gonna be minus X. This is gonna be minus three X because of the coefficient and we're going to have plus 2x on our product side. That means we're going to come down and go 0.862 minus x, 0.373 minus 3x, and 2x. Any questions on the ice table here, how it's set up? Again, even those pressures works exactly the same way as uh, what we've done before. And just like we did before with concentrations and everything, we're going to put this into our expression. So this is gonna be our KP expression. So our KP will equal the partial pressure squared of NH3 divided by the partial pressure of NH3. That's NH3 twice, let's try N2 would be better there. I got an eraser somewhere. Take two, there we go. All right, so that's actually N2 on this side. So that would be better. And the partial pressure, we do need a qubit of the H2. And again, that's gonna equal our 4.31 times 10 to the minus four. Yeah. So <clears throat> we're going to put everybody in. So when we put everybody in, uh, we will end up with uh, 2x, squared. And now that we have 2x squared, we will have over our n2, which is 0 0.862 minus x. And we're going to take our 0.373 minus 3x. And we need not to forget to actually cube it as well. And that is going to equal our 4.31 times 10 to the minus four. Now, when you look at this, we need to solve this. So probably the right move is like, you know, go to the next problem and skip this one, right? Maybe that's not the right move, I guess, but might be. So we could sort of solve it mathematically, like we did a quadratic or something like that, but obviously you got some cubes in there and all that kind of stuff that's going to occur. So we're always looking for maybe a better way to do it. And one way that we could kind of solve this type of problem is really based on what we see here with our equilibrium constant. And when we see our equilibrium constant there, we should recognize that that equilibrium constant is a small value, right? And that is a small value of K. 
And because that's a small value of K, what that means is when we reach equilibrium, we mainly have reactants. And what that also means is because we mainly have reactants, when this thing reaches equilibrium, we are not going to have a lot of products perhaps being made. And really what that's going to mean is the change part is going to be relatively small. So the change part here, which is the X part, is going to be small. So the change or the X will be small. So in a situation where you have a small K value, you can make an assumption. You could assume that X is equal to zero. So can you assume that every X you got in there is equal to zero? The answer is no, because you got nothing to solve for. The X's that you can make zero are any X's that you're going to subtract from a number are any X's you would add to a number. So if you had a number there to start with and you're gonna subtract an X from it or had a number, you're gonna add an X to it. Those are the ones you could zero out. So in our expression, that means we can zero out not the top guy, but we could zero out our bottom ones. And now what we end up with is something that is a little bit more manageable in terms of the math. The reason we cannot zero out the top X as well, as I mentioned before, is you have nothing to solve for in that case. But if you just think about what's happening with that top X, it started at zero which means even if it gained a super small amount, that is a lot of gaining from where it started. It started at zero, right? As opposed to our reactants that started at like 0 0.86, 0 0.37. So when it loses a little, it still has a good amount from where it started. But since you started at zero there on the product side, uh, it, whatever it makes is going to be relatively large from where it started. So again, that's why we technically don't zero out the top guy other than the logical part that you would have nothing to solve for, obviously, if you got rid of all the X's. So now we're gonna solve this. So we're gonna clean up the bottom there. So we're gonna take uh, 0.373, we're gonna cube it. We're gonna times it by 0.862, and that gives us 0 0.0447, and we're gonna multiply that to the other side. So we're gonna multiply that by 4.31. Make sure, again, you use your exponent button to the negative four, and that should get us, we're also going to obviously uh, square the top there. So on the left-hand side, we will be left with four X squared, and we'll end up with 0 0.00001928, and let me see what you're asking here. Yeah, so again, we, we don't set the X on top uh, to zero. There's really two reasons, but one's really the true reason. One is more the logical reason. If we set the X on top, for example, up here, this guy, to zero as well, uh, we would have nothing to solve for. So that's the logical sort of answer to that. But the real answer is because what we started with in terms of NH3 originally was zero, that's how much we started with in terms of the pressure. There was nothing. That anything it gains is going to be significantly large compared to where it started. So since it started at zero, even if you gain just like a smidge above it, that's going to be relatively large compared to where it started. And that's different than the other two that we zeroed out because we started at 0.862, for example. That 0.862, whatever we lose, is not going to be very significant from where we started. And again, that's truly why we don't get rid of the one on top uh, because we started at zero. So whatever it gains is gonna be significant from where it started. Any other questions on that? All right, so I think we want to then divide by four, do a little square root action on it. And we will hopefully get an answer when it's all said and done. X should equal zero point zero zero two twenty we'll call it first off any questions on that part of it now you can make this assumption here but 
like anything else, when you take a shortcut, right, you got to make sure it's a good idea to do that or not. And the way that we check to make sure, you know, it's okay to kind of do that is there's a couple of different ways you could check. But for our class, we're going to use what is sometimes referred to as the 5% rule. And the 5% rule means you're going to take your X value that you got. So in our case, we got 0 0.00220. We're going to actually divide it by what we were going to subtract it from. So in this case, that is 0 0.862. And we're going to times it by 100. And if you do that, you get something like 0.25%. And that is less than 5%. So that means that our assumption is good. So our assumption is good, right? Some happy faces, a check, whatever you like to do there. So our assumption there is going to be good. So if you make this assumption, you do need to check it to make sure it's okay. It won't always be okay. So you definitely wanna make sure that you don't skip over that point. If you happen to have checked this and it's not okay, what that means is you need to go back and solve it some other way. And for our purposes, it will most likely be you need to go back and do the quadratic formula uh, to solve it. Um, <clears throat> you also can check it with not just the one I did, but you could do it with the other one there as well. You could take the 0.373, uh, you could take three times our X value, divide it by 0.373 times it by 100, and you'll end up with, I forget what it is, I think we'll have it on a slide coming up, but it's like maybe 2% or something like that. It's also good. In my experience, if you check one of the reactants and it's good, you're probably going to be okay on the other one. You don't necessarily have to check them all, uh, but you usually should at least check one to make sure that it's okay. So again, if it's over 5%, uh, you do need to go back and solve it some other way. So this brings up a couple of points. A, we haven't finished the problem, obviously. Uh, we'll get to putting our X value back in. Um, so why don't we do that first here and just to finish up this problem. So let's grab that out of the way so we can see. All right, so we're gonna take uh, for our N2, 0.862 minus our X value, 0.0022. And that looks like we get for our N2, and since I'm running out of room, I was just gonna write the final answer, 0.860 it looks like. And remember that these are pressures, so that's gonna get atmospheres in terms of the unit. For our H2, we're gonna take 0.373 minus three times the X value. And that looks like it will get us uh, 0 0.366 and also going to get atmospheres because it's a pressure. And lastly, for our NH3, we're going to take 2 times 0 0.00220, going to get us uh, 0 0.00440, also atmospheres because it is a pressure. And again, if we pop that back into our equilibrium expression, it ideally should give us somewhere around where we started, uh, which would be that 4.3 times 10 to the minus four. And you get something like 4.6. So pretty close uh, with some rounding in terms of that. First off, questions on any of those steps along the way that we did or anything like that? So let's talk about a couple of things uh, with this sort of way of solving. Uh, you may be asking yourself, why did we not necessarily do this on the previous examples, especially that one where we had all that foiling wonderfulness and all that good stuff. And the reason we did not do it on the previous examples was if you go back to our previous examples, I believe the first equilibrium constant we had was seven. And then I think on the other two examples, uh, it was 
So both of those equilibrium constants are large values for the equilibrium constant. So remember, anything above one is considered large. So what that means is when we do reach equilibrium in those, pro in those uh, reactions, we will have a lot of products that have been made. And that means that the change part or the X part is significant in that case. And that's why you cannot do the assumption on anything that is really above one. You really shouldn't do it. Only values that are small for the equilibrium constant is where you should do that. Any questions on that? So again, that's why we did not do it on the previous ones. And we did it here because of the value of the equilibrium constant is small. Now, second to it, you can do the assumption and a lot of times it can sort of help you uh, maybe solve a problem a little quicker. Um, if you're not comfortable doing it or you don't wanna do it or you're afraid that if the assumption doesn't work, you gotta go back and do it a different way. Anyways, you can just straight off the bat go right into like the quadratic or something like that and solve it. And you really should get the same answer regardless of which way you did it. So if you choose, you could do that. You could just skip the whole assumption part and just do it long way if you will. Uh, I would probably recommend because of time constraints and stuff like that, uh, you know, if you can try the assumption, I would give it a, a go because uh, pretty quickly you can kind of figure out if it's good or bad. And uh, it probably won't waste that much time, but it may gain you a lot of valuable time uh, when you do it. Any questions on that or how to solve uh, these guys? You got uh, 0.3 from uh, punching in with my number. Uh, let me just double check real quick might be you are uh, yes yep uh, let's see here point three six six right for the h2 yeah So, uh, okay, got, okay. Uh, with my numbers, again, if you did it by yourself, you might've rounded a little bit different and you might have got a slightly different number. Um, let me just see what we got here, just correct. Yeah, so that is exactly correct. Again, the assumption method should only be used when you have an equilibrium constant that is considered small. So basically what that means is anything less than one, Anything you see like a negative exponent on your uh, equilibrium constant, you could give it a go. Anything that's a positive exponent or like a whole number like we had before, 54.3, you know, or seven, probably you should not do it on those. Uh, I think I got everybody's question, I think. Any other questions on this particular one here? Okay, so. I'll show you this. This is uh, what we just went over in case you want something that's a little neater to look at. You could watch the video back later. Again, it'll help you go to sleep if you need or something like that. So there's that, we'll show that. Here's the checking I did. And again, here's how you could check it if you want to check the other one as well. Again, in most cases, if you check one it's good, it's probably gonna be good for the other one, but you can check it if you like. All right, before we finish up sort of the last topic here in this chapter, any questions on ice tables, how to do them or anything like that? Um, let me just tell you that there is another way that you could solve these sort of ice table problems. And again, it's what's known as successive approximation. And uh, successive approximation basically means that, well, I know the X value has got to be less than 0.862 here. And basically what you would do is you just pick a number and put it in for these two X values. And then you would solve for X. And if you solve for X and get the same number that you put in for the other X's, then you're good. If not, then you take that number you got, put it back in. And you continuously do this process of putting an X value in, solving for X, putting the X value back in, solving for X, until you basically end up with the X value you put in is the X value that you get out and then you would be correct. So that could go pretty bad for people and we will not have any problems where uh, we do successive approximation, but you may see it in like a, uh, a book or something like that as a way people solve some of these problems. 
and it's a perfectly fine way of doing it, but nothing in our class will be solved through successive approximation. So there's really kind of three ways we could solve it in this class. Uh, the three ways we kind of did here in these examples, you could have something like we had originally that was like a perfect square. So you could kind of perfect square root both sides. You could have something where you need to use the quadratic formula, which would be probably the most difficult math type of solving we'll do. And lastly, you could do something like here where you would do an assumption and you could solve it. So really for us, those are the three ways we're going to do it. The fourth way is successive approximation. And again, uh, if you're not maybe good at that or think really clearly about what you're doing, you could send yourself down a really bad uh, cycle of never being able to finish the problem. So uh, we will not solve anything through successive approximation. Any questions on the ice tables or any of that type of stuff there? Okay, so to finish out this chapter here and talk about Le Chatelet's principle and Le Chatelet's principle, generally speaking, Good to talk. <laughs> Generally speaking, is this uh, we have a system that has basically reached equilibrium. <clears throat> so we essentially have this system at equilibrium, which again means that the rate of that forward reaction is going to equal the rate of the reverse reaction. And then what we do to this system that's at equilibrium is we stress it out. So we add a stress. to the system. Now, when we add a stress to the system, much like the name implies, it really kind of stresses it out. And what it does is it, for lack of a better word, screws up the equilibrium, yeah? It messes it up. There's no longer gonna be at equilibrium. So the system itself, though, does wanna get back to that equilibrium state. So it's going to try to get itself back to an equilibrium state after you sort of messed it up. And in order to do that, there's sort of three things that could sort of happen. It may need to shift to the right, which essentially means it needs to make more products. It may need to shift to the left, which basically means it needs to make more reactants. Right? Or there actually are situations where, you know, even if you know you did something to it, it's actually not going to cause a change to occur at all. So those are sort of the three things that we commonly refer to when we talk about Le Chatelier's principle, shift to the right, shift to the left, no change that occurs. So when we talk about stresses that we can do to a system, concentration is one stress that you could do. And in terms of concentration, you could either add or remove concentration. You could also play with the pressure and volume. You could also play with the temperature, which means you could either obviously increase or decrease the temperature. And the last thing you could do is add a catalyst to it. A catalyst is something that you add to a chemical reaction and usually its main purpose is to speed up that chemical reaction. Remember that a catalyst is not a reactant. It's not a product. Uh, it is there simply usually just to facilitate that reaction occurring faster. There are negative catalysts that actually make the reaction slow down. But usually when people talk about a catalyst, they're talking about it in the sense of speeding up the reaction. So we're going to look at each of these things and see how they affect systems at equilibrium. Uh, we're going to look at concentration, pressure, volume, and temperature. So let's get going here. Let's start with concentration. And really, when we talk about concentration, as I mentioned, there's really two things that you can do in terms of concentration. You could either add or you could remove. And when we add concentration, it will shift away from the side you added it to. So AA is a good way to remember that, add away. And if you remove concentration, it will shift to this, it will shift towards, 
Yeah, come here. It will shift towards the side you removed it from. So if you add concentration, it shifts away. If you remove concentration, it goes towards it. And so just to sort of illustrate, when we're talking about sides, people oftentimes get confused about sort of sides. And this very simple approach to sides is you have a reactant side, right? And you've got a product side when you look at the equation. Remember in reality, when you have all this in a beaker, you know, there's not like a left-hand side of the beaker or right-hand side of the beaker or anything like that. These are all technically floating around, you know, together in a beaker, for example, in a solution. But when we talk about sort of left or right, you know, we're talking about the balanced equation and sort of the left-hand side of the arrow, the right-hand side of the arrow, uh, when we talk about those things. So let's just sort of see what happens here. Let me try my uh, award-winning drawings here. So we have a system that is at equilibrium. This is some good stick figures there. We'll call this side the reactant side. We'll call this side the product side. And if I add something, so let's say we add some people to the right-hand side here, what's going to happen in this case We'll go advanced stick figures, but faces. And on this side, unhappy face, he's going to go up, right? Because we added more guys to the right-hand side of our little teeter-totter. To fix this situation, do we need to put more people on the product side or more people on the reactant side? And hopefully you should be able to see that to fix the situation, we really need to put more people over here on the left-hand side. And if we do that, we will once again be able to come back to equilibrium. Good thing I majored in stick figure in college. That and bowling, it worked really well for me. So we have uh, both of these things here and we're back at equilibrium. So this would be like equilibrium position one. This would be equilibrium position two. Any questions on that? We could also do kind of a similar approach if we had our same guys there to start with on our teeter-totter. Again, this being our reactant side, this being our product side. The guy on the right-hand side just said, decided, I'm good. I'm just going to hop off. When he hops off, this is going to happen, right? Poor guy on the left-hand side there is going to come crashing down. Again, giving an unhappy face. And then now to fix this, to make him better, we need to shift towards the side that got removed to put them back together. And then we will once again now achieve equilibrium with my bad stick figure drawing. Thank you. That's my artwork for today. That is my stick figureness. Yes. <clears throat> so when we add, it goes away. When we remove, it goes towards the side we removed it from. And what's important here is a couple of things. Let's talk about in practicality how we actually do these things. So when I say shift away, uh, it depends on which side of the equation you're removing or, or you're adding to. So if you add more reactants, it will shift towards the products and more products will be made. If you add more products, it will cause the reaction to go towards the reactant side. So this is very similar to what we were talking about at the very beginning of this chapter. If you remember, it was maybe like the third slide, fourth slide in. We had that equation up there and it said, what happens to everybody's concentration when we add more H2 or more water? And when we would add, for example, more reactants in this example here, if we added more reactants, that's gonna make the forward reaction start to occur. And that's gonna produce more products. So it's gonna make that forward reaction start to occur. It's gonna make more products being made to once again reach equilibrium. 
just like if we added more products, it would cause it to go to the reactant side. And because it's causing that reverse reaction basically to occur. And the opposite is true when we remove something, when we remove a reactant, we're kind of deficient on the reactant side. So it's got to go towards the reactant side to kind of fill that deficiency. And same thing if we remove a product, we're kind of deficient there on the product side. It's got to go towards the product side uh, to remove it. So let's just talk about practically how you kind of do that. The adding part's pretty simple. The adding part's like you take it off the shelf and you pour it into the beaker, right? So if I wanted to add a reactant or want to add a product to this beaker, I just simply take it and you know, pour it in there, right? And I obviously would have added more. If I wanna remove something, say from a solution, one of the components of the reaction, do I just reach in with my hand and grab it? I hope you're saying no right now. I hope you really are. You probably shouldn't do that. I'm sure there's like a safety video that says probably don't do that as well. That's probably not a good, good way of doing that. So how do we, for example, remove something from a solution that's a solution. Basically what a solution is, right, in most cases is ions that are floating around. So one very common way that you can remove something from a solution is by actually adding something to the solution. But the deal is when you add something to the solution, it will, rea it will react with somebody in the reaction and form a precipitate. Yeah, a PPT, a precipitate. And when we form a precipitate, that's important because that precipitate is now a solid. And we know solids are not included in the equilibrium. And more important, in order to form a solid, so let's just say, for example, we had a beaker floating around with silver ions, and we decided to dump some chloride in there. Everybody remembers their solubility rules. I hope you're nodding right about now. That is going to make silver chloride, right? Which is that white solid you get when you put those together. And what that essentially will do when I add the chloride to that solution is it's essentially grabbing out the silver ions and making them a solid. And now because that silver is in the solid, it no longer will participate in the equilibrium. So you essentially have removed it from that solution. There's also another way that you can remove something from a solution. Unlike a precipitate, which you can really visually see, right? When you make a solid, you can visually see, oh, I just made a solid there in the beaker. Another way that you can, I'll get your question in just one second. Another way that you can remove it is to make something that's a pure liquid. And the most common pure liquid that you can make usually in these situations is our good friend water. So for example, let's say you had a beaker and you had some H plus ions floating around and you decide to add your good friend hydroxide in there. We should also know when we take H plus and OH minus, that should make a good friend known as water, right? Which is a pure liquid. And when you make water, you won't visually be able to see the water being made but you will essentially be removing the H plus ions from that solution and obviously causing a change usually in the equilibrium. So those are two very common ways that you can sort of in reality, remove something from a solution. Uh, very common ways, make a precipitate and make something like water. Uh, in terms of the solubility rules, um, that was the right way to say this, I suppose. You should have a basic understanding of them. And uh, I don't know if you'll be tested like directly on them, but you should definitely have an understanding of them. Um, in terms of sort of lecture or textbook type problems, there'll be a lot of information as we go through. We're gonna talk about KSP, which has to do a lot with solubility and solubility rules. But when we get to that chapter, there'll be a lot of information in the problems that will help you probably determine you know, is this thing soluble or insoluble? Um, but if you have a general understanding of the solubility rules, which you should hopefully at this point, uh, that's probably a pretty good idea. You probably should go review them if it's been a while, um, but that would definitely be helpful for you. Where it would actually be extremely helpful for you in this class 
and probably still here, even though we're doing the labs on, online and stuff like that, is in the lab part. All the qualitative analysis experiments that we do are we're going to do, uh, they're basically all about precipitation, solubility rules, and all that kind of stuff. So you're really going to see a lot of that sort of solubility rules and stuff come into play when we get into those qualitative analysis type experiments, uh, especially probably in like some post lab questions and those type of things. So I would recommend that you review the solubility rules because uh, it definitely is going to be helpful in that aspect uh, when we talk about uh, definitely those uh, qualitative analysis type experiments. Other questions on that? All right, so let's then talk about temperature that I just uh, you know wrote all over there. So I'm going to write temperature on this slide here. I'm not sure what that's going to be, but we'll see it in a second maybe. But let's talk about temperature. And remember that temperature is the only thing that will affect the actual value of the equilibrium constant. So like we talked about earlier, uh, if you change the temperature, the actual value of K will actually change as the temperature changes. Now, temperature works the same way as concentration. So it works the same as concentration. And what that means is if you increase the temperature, it will shift away. And if you decrease the temperature, it will shift towards. So away and towards, there's gotta be more to it than just that, and there is. It all revolves whether or not the reaction is endothermic or exothermic. And remember, one way you could determine endothermic or exothermic is by the delta H value. If the delta H value is positive, that means it's an endothermic reaction. If the delta H value is negative, that means it's a exothermic reaction. So what that means is exothermic heat and energy is being released, which means that if you write an equation, and the delta H is negative, it's exothermic, and heat and energy is considered a product, which means it would be on the product side. While if the reaction was endothermic, heat and energy would be considered a reactant, and the delta H would be a positive number. So when we talk about shift towards or shift away, you do have to determine whether or not the reaction is endothermic or exothermic. And that means that if the reaction is exothermic and you increase the temperature, it will shift to the left. And if you decrease the temperature in an exothermic, that'll be like removing the heat, which is on the product side, it will go towards the product side. And it's basically the opposite here, with our endothermic. In an endothermic, if you increase the temperature, that is like adding more reactants, so it will shift away. And if you decrease the temperature, that will be like removing reactants and it would shift towards it. So when you deal with temperature, you do have to determine exothermic or endothermic. And then that's pretty much how it's gonna shift depending on what you do. If you take your test tubes and you throw it into a beaker of boiling water, you'll increase the temperature. If you take them and put them on some ice, it will decrease the temperature. And again, depending on whether it's exothermic or endothermic, it will allow you to uh, know which way is going to shift. Any questions on temperature? Again, temperature is the only thing that will affect the actual value of the equilibrium constant, again, as we talked about a number of times over the last couple of days. Okay, so let's go here. So let's talk about the next thing, which is pressure. And really pressure and volume are really related to each other. And when you think about pressure and volume, 
you should think about that wonderful gas law that involves pressure and volume. That's our good friend, perhaps Boyle, yeah? And remember in Boyle's law, the relationship between pressure and volume is as the pressure goes up, the volume goes down and vice versa, as the pressure goes down, the volume will go up. And because it deals with pressure, that also should make you think about an important aspect of everybody. You should think about gases. And when we look at a reaction, if we increase the pressure, so the change that sort of occurred is the pressure jumped up we kind of want to bring the pressure back down to equilibrium where it was before. So I always personally look at the volume aspect of it. So if I increase the pressure, the volume is going to get smaller. And that means that in that smaller volume, we need more or less gas molecules to bring the pressure down. And hopefully you remember that if in a smaller volume, you would actually need less gas molecules to bring the pressure back down. So in that situation where we have an increase in pressure, a decrease in volume, it will shift to the side with the least number of gas molecules. Now, obviously that is going to be reaction dependent as to which side has the more gas molecules, which side has the less gas molecules. And it's not very complicated to figure out. You go to the coefficient and you just add up everybody with a G next to it. So everybody with a G next to it, you figure out how many totally got on the left-hand side, how many got on the right-hand side, kind of like how we did the delta N in those uh, problems we did earlier. So you want to figure out which side has more or least. And the opposite is true if we decrease the pressure that means that the volume here is going to get much bigger. And in that bigger space, in order to bring the pressure back up, we would need more gas molecules to fill it up. More gas molecules will give you more reactions, more collisions, and bring that pressure back up. And we would need to shift to the side with more gas molecules. So pressure and volume are always sort of related to each other in these type of problems. And again, I would always sort of think about it in terms of volume, small volume, whichever way gets you the uh, least number of gas molecules, left, right, and uh, more volume, more gas molecules. Any question on that there? So again, the last thing that we talked about is a catalyst. And if you add a catalyst, it will actually have no change on the equilibrium. Other things that could cause a no change is adding like a noble gas. Noble gases are chemically inert, which means they essentially will not you know, cause too much of a change. Any questions on Le Chatelier's principle? Now that we sort of talked about it, let's go through some examples and just make sure everybody's on the same page. We're gonna ignore all the stuff on the bottom. We're just gonna look at this reaction, forget about all the numbers that are here. Um, so let's just look at this reaction and let's just say for the sake of argument, this may be wrong, but let's just say the delta H value is negative here, okay? So I'm gonna give you some examples and you tell me, is it gonna to shift to the right, to the left or no change, okay? So I'll give you a few, take a minute and try to figure it out and then we'll talk about it. Let's figure out what happens if you add more N2, what happens if you remove NH3, if you increase the pressure, if you decrease the temperature. All right, so take a moment or two, figure out what happens in each of those cases based on this reaction here.
Okay, so let's take a look. So if we add more N2, N2 is on the left-hand side. When we add, it shifts away from it. So it's going to shift this equilibrium to the right. Again, add away. So since the N2 is on the left-hand side, we go that way. We're going to then remove NH3. When we remove, it goes towards the side. So since the NH3 is on the right-hand side, it's also going to cause it to shift to the right. We're going to increase the pressure here. So remember that pressure and volume are related. So if the pressure goes up, the volume should go down. And because the volume is now smaller, what we're looking for is less gas molecules to fit in that small space. So when we look on the reactant side, there's one gas molecule and three is a total of four gas molecules on the left. On the right-hand side, we have two. I'm getting those numbers from the coefficients because all of these guys are Gs, yeah? They're all gases. That means in this particular case, it will actually also shift it to the right, which is right all the way, apparently. And lastly here, we're going to look at a decrease in temperature. So that is where our delta H comes involved. Our delta H is negative, which means that this is a exothermic reaction in my made up example. Also means that if we were to write heat and energy into the equation, it would find itself over here on the product side. And that means that we would be decreasing or removing heat and energy on the right. So it works the same way as concentration. So since we removed on the right, it's going to go towards it. Look at that. I went all the way to the right on all four of those. Any questions on any of those there? Okay. And since we're going a little long, we only have one more example. Why don't we just go through one more just to make sure. Then we'll be kind of officially done with this one. Uh, that was the same one we just did. Let's get to this one here. All right. Let's do this one here, and it's endothermic, and it is missing a coefficient there. should have a two. Now we're balanced. That's good. All right, so let's do some of these ones here. Let us, uh, let's increase the temperature. Let us uh, increase the volume. Let us add NO. Let us remove N2. Let us add a catalyst. All right, take a minute or two and see what you come up with. Okay, so let's see how we did. So we're gonna increase the temperature. So again, the important part here is endothermic, which means the delta H would be a positive number. Also would mean we would put the heat and energy on the reactant side over there. So if we increase the temperature, it's like adding more heat and energy to the reactant side, should then shift away from it and should go to the right in this particular case. If we increase the volume, so remember volume and pressure are related. So if we increase the volume, the pressure is going to go down. But more importantly is the volume. 
And remember that when we have a larger volume, we need more gas molecules. So if we add up our gas molecules on the left-hand side, that is two. And if we do it on the right-hand side, that is also two. That is what we call a tie, right? So there is no side that's more, there's no side that's less. And that is one case where you will get a no change situation happening, yeah? So again, no change in that case because there really is not a side that's more or less in terms of your gas molecules. If we add NO, NO is over here on the product side. So again, we're adding NO, so we're going to shift away from it. So finally, we go to the left-hand side, huh? So we're gonna shift something to the left there in that case. We're then going to remove N2. N2 is on the left-hand side. When we remove, it goes towards the side we removed it from. So it's gonna shift to the left. And lastly here, we're going to add a catalyst. And again, a catalyst will also cause a no change. You're just gonna get there quicker with a catalyst, most likely, most likely, but it will not affect it shifting one way or the other when you add a catalyst, because technically a catalyst, again, is not a reactant nor a product. So it's just there to facilitate the reaction occurring faster. Any questions on Le Chatelier's principle here? And if I'm not mistaken, that should be chapter 13, believe it or not. So we're done with chapter 13. Also a reminder that uh, coming up next week, I think at the end of next week, yeah, welcome to summer school. Our first exam is coming. So definitely gonna cover chapter 13, gonna cover some of 14, which we'll get started on Monday. And obviously we'll decide next week towards the beginning, you know, which parts there is gonna cover of 14 or how much of it it will cover, if not all of it. It might cover all, but it might cover less than that. We'll see. Any questions on any of that stuff going on here? Okay, so uh, again, a reminder, I think I mentioned last time, again, the recordings will be up on the, in our module section on our Canvas site. And in case you wanna review some of this stuff, uh, you can as well. Um, today, we're going to do experiment number three, which is really the second part of the experiment we did yesterday. Uh, it's a little bit more calculation based on ice tables and stuff like that. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, sort of the calculations and stuff that you're going to be doing. Uh, we'll watch the video and all that. Um, there will be. So in, in the next day or so, I'll put up there some review material uh, for exam one. And as soon as I get a chance to kind of copy it over, I just want to look at it before I kind of pop it up there. But uh, maybe not today, but maybe by tomorrow, it should be hopefully be up there. If you don't see it, just shoot me an email to remind me just in case, okay? but I'll try to put it up there. Other questions? Okay, so since we did run a little bit long here, I think it's good for everybody to get up and stretch a little bit. So why don't we start lab about 315. Again, we're gonna kind of do the same thing. Uh, we're going to talk about the experiment. We're gonna watch the video. It's a little shorter video this time. And then uh, we'll watch it together like we did last time. And then for the rest of the time, you'll be able to knock out hopefully the uh, the calculations and the post lab and all that kind of stuff that you need to do, okay? So make sure you come back through the lab meeting link that's on Canvas there in the module section and we'll start about 3.15, okay? Other than that, if you didn't put here in the chat box when you originally got here, make sure you do that for roll and otherwise I will see everybody in about 15 minutes or so.